So please welcome our guest for this evening, Richard E. Grant. Hi. Thank Hello, welcome. Hi. Thank you for being here. Uh, Thank you well, for having me. let's begin. You have written and indeed made a film about your, your background and your upbringing um, in Swaziland, and uh, it's interesting that someone who tends to be so associated with a certain kind of quintessential Britishness is actually also, in some ways, a, a foreigner from, a, from an expat world that is almost a sort of distilled. Britishness. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that early life, that background? Uh, well, I think that uh, colonial life in uh, Swaziland, which was uh, a British protectorate up until 1968, um, from what I've heard from what people subsequently have told me, that it was like an equatorial Ealing, like suburban England mm. in the 1950s. So it had all the sort of twitching curtain, hi close hierarchy of the English class system, um, while at the same time being completely undermined by booze, bonking, and boredom. Uh, which is exactly what my mother was susceptible to, and why, when I was 10 years old, I inadvertently woke up on the back seat of a car and found her fucking my father's best friend on the front seat. Uh, dear diary. Uh, tried God, there was no answer. I couldn't tell my friends, couldn't tell my father. Certainly couldn't tell my mother. So uh, I started writing, and that, that then finally culminated decades later in my autobiographical film, Wawa, um, mm -hmm. which opens with that scene in the car. Mm. Um, and my mother thought she looked marvelous. Because <laughs> Miranda Richardson played her so marvelously well. So <laughs> narcissists don't see themselves other than reflected glory. When did the idea come to you of being a performer? I don't know that it really, um, I can't remember it one particular moment, but I, I knew that, um, you know, again, you look back on your life, and I'm now so old, I'm 60, that, um, yes, <gasps> I feel the same way, um, is that I've got photographs of when I was seven making shoebox theatres mm -hmm. with lollipop sticks and little cut-out figures, and then glove puppets and then string puppets, and you know, again, it was like a phase of pimples that you, you, everybody says, oh, you'll pass through that. And when I said to my father that I thought that I would like to make a living as an actor or try and be an actor, he said, well, I think it's a very bad idea. And I said, why? And he said, because basically you will get buggered and have to wear tights <laughs> and makeup, all of which is true. <laughs> how, uh, how, how did you prepare yourself for these things? How, how did you decide to come back, well, to come I've to Britain? I've worn steel reinforced <laughs> underpants. And uh, yeah, oh, then, then when I, after, my father said, you can't, I won't pay for you to, because he says that your A-level results are too good and your brain too fast to just waste it on going to drama school in case you don't succeed. Because there was no precedent in our family for mm. anybody who'd gone into the, the profession. He did, we didn't know any actors. Mm. So he said, if you can find uh, a university that has a drama school attached, which he knew didn't exist, <laughs> um, he said, I'll pay for that. Right. And then I found out from, there was an architect who, who did amateur plays in Swaziland and directed them. And he said that at Cape Town University, which was 1,200 miles south, you could, there was a drama school attached to the university. So I wrote to them and I said, is this possible? And they said, well, they don't really combine the two. Um, but they would make exception on academic achievement. So I thought, right, okay. So I got good results, and because my father said I had a good brain, <laughs> and then I got, and I managed to combine the two. So he had to pay very reluctantly, like you know, a dog going down a sand dune like that. <laughs> Buggery and tights being at the end of it. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's what I did. And then I co-founded a theatre company um, and worked at the Yvonne Bryceland, Ethel Fugard company, that, uh, uh, multiracial uh, theatre that they'd set up in Cape Town. I did that for two years and then emigrated in 1982. Mm -hmm. Just as Mrs. Fork Mrs. Thatcher mo moseyed into the Falklands yeah. and blew everybody up. <laughs> <laughs> A good time to go and be British then. So. Yeah. 
Um, and did you have an idea of what kind of actor you wanted to be? Were there, were there actors whose careers or whose personas you sort of wanted to emulate? Was yeah, I was inspired by two people, both of whom had very long faces <laughs> and were deemed un, unlikely to succeed. And one was Donald Sutherland, who had grown up in a tiny village somewhere in remote Canada. And he looked so gangly and weird in Kelly's Heroes. And I thought, fuck, if he can be an actor, I can have a go. <laughs> um, and the other one was Barbara Streisand, who I was completely obsessed with, um, and still am, uh, to my wife's annoyance. Um, and I thought, well, he, she doesn't look like a conventional person either. And she succeeded. So those two people who I've subsequently, subsequently met um, were my real inspirations. Did you tell them that when you met them? I did. I lay down on the floor. <laughs> <clears throat> I did, literally. I did. And they said, arise. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I did. So you have to have heroes or heroines, I think. And uh, I just haven't, I haven't progressed through the phase of realizing that it's buggery and tights and that you're supposed to get over the phase of worshipping another human being. So that's, that's my story. So when you, when you came to, to London initially, when you came to Britain, um, yeah. what, what were you expecting to happen and what did happen? I had followed the Glasgow Sits Theatre um, in Plays and Players magazine, which used to come out once a month. And a critic called Cordelia Oliver wrote all the reviews to the Glasgow Sits, and they had these amazing adverts with people sniffing cocaine and David Heyman lying stark <laughs> naked upside down. And the, the, the design of Philip Prowse's sets and the costumes and everything was so arresting. And I'd never seen any pictures like this in a theater before or since. And I thought, well, that's the theater that I've got to go and try and work in. So I wrote them fan letters, and I then did two of their plays before I came to London. And I got off the plane, which was the Glasgow Herald, <laughs> and I thought, this is a sign. I was still stupidly superstitious in those days. And I bought the stage newspaper at Heathrow Airport, and in a big black box, it said, next to boy dancers wanted in Dubai, before <laughs> Dubai went up. Um, there was this thing saying, Glasgow sits, open, open auditions at the um, Roundhouse Theatre in London. And I got there, and all the people there said, oh, you'll, you'll never get in, because we started queuing at 2 o'clock in the morning. So I went back at 2 o'clock in the morning the next night, and I got in, I got down, I think they saw 3,000 people. I got down to the last 20, then da down to the last 16, and they said they were going to take eight of us. And when they didn't choose me, I went to bed for a week in my oh, bed sit, crap. and I thought, fuck Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> I was furious. So all my, my whole master plan was just absolutely annihilated, so I became a waiter in Covent Garden instead. <laughs> But I did have the satisfaction of Philip Prowse, the director, meeting me one day, and he said, oh, darling, you'd have, you're so sits, you should have come. And I said, well, it's too fucking late now. <laughs> so it was my great dream to be at the Glasgow. Oh. So I took a train up, and I, then I came to the Edinburgh Festival at the same time in that August, 1982. Saw a whole bunch of plays here and went to the sits. And it just made my teeth fall out that I couldn't work there. <laughs> anyway. So then, was there a new master plan then that, that culminated Yeah, in just get any job. Any job. <laughs> yeah. So I worked as a waiter, and, um, and then I set up a, a lunch hour play in order to get an agent, and that's how I sort of st started getting dribbles of work. Mm -hmm. So being nine months out of work in 1985 was the perfect preparation to, be, to play an out-of-work actor mm. in Withnail and I. And thank fuck Daniel Day-Lewis turned down the part. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just retired, too. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. He has three Oscars, so he can afford to. <laughs> I, I thought I remembered hearing that you didn't really like talking about Withnail. Is that something that is... It's a lie. Is it a lie? <laughs> it's Good. a lie. Who told you that? I don't know. I thought you were sort of... That you didn't like your career being dominated by this one film that you'd done right at the beginning. Is that not the case? No. Good, because we want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, you can ask me anything you like. Brilliant. <laughs> Talking I talk more than Irish people, so you may have to <laughs> set the clock up there. No, and we, go, we've got just time. do that wind-up stuff or start singing, and then I'll know to go on to the next bit. Speaking of people turning down the parts in Withnail, this, this is a bit from a, from a piece um, for, that Louise Brealey wrote in, in 1996, and this is Bruce Robinson. And he said, um, I offered Paul's part to Ken Branagh, and he turned me down. He wanted to play with Nail, and I didn't want him to do that. I didn't think he had enough nobility. Marvelous actor that he is, there's something about Ken that is the antithesis of Byron-esque. He looks like a partially cooked donut. <laughs> 
it's Bruce Robinson, it's not me. Richard looks like fucking Byron, you know. When I met him and asked him to read, there's a line in the film where they're trying to do some washing up and he says, fork it, about a rotten boiled egg or something, and he did it perfectly, and I thought, if he can do that for one line. So that was what, is that true? Because you've that, got diaries of all of this. So you yeah, know that is true. He said, he, well, he, he asked me to start reading, and I read, he said, do you think it's funny? And I said, yes, very, very funny. I was almost stuttering, I was so nervous, because I knew that it was such a great part, and I'd never been up for a film before. And we got to this one, he said, why are you doing it like a sort of rep version of Noel Coward? And I said, right, okay, I'll start again. So I did, and I had the script in one hand, and uh, came this line in the kitchen scene, where the washing up scene at the beginning of the film, and I said, fuck it, <laughs> like that. And the script went that way, and my fingers went straight towards his eyeballs, and he laughed. And uh, he said, oh, you can come back tomorrow. <laughs> um, but then I was so paranoid and so fucking riddled with anxiety that I thought come back tomorrow meant I would then be reading in, because I knew this happened, I would be reading in for the person who was actually cast in order to just be the guinea pig for mm. other people mm. reading the parts. So it only dawned on me after about 10 days that I was a serious contender. And then uh, Michael Maloney, who'd been cast as the Marwood character that Paul McGann played, um, as we were going down the Notting Hill Gate tube station at the end, there were you know, pre-mobile phone days, there was a row of uh, telephone boxes. And he went, having been told that he had got, and that they wanted two people that matched each other in order to be the right pairing, he went and shoved money down this fucking machine and phoned up his agent and said, oh, I don't want to do this film if they offer it. And I said, what do you mean, what do you mean? He said, oh, it's anti-black, it's anti-Irish, the directors are drunk, and I don't think it's ever going to happen. And I said, you, you can't do this. This is, this is, I'll wait all this time. And uh, he said, no, and he went down the escalator. And I thought, oh, fuck. And I got home. And I was so depressed. And I said to my wife, who's here tonight, 35 years later, and she said, um, why don't you call your agent? And I said, I can't, I can't. You know, I've just got this new agent and disaster. Anyway, I have eventually at 6 o'clock phoned him. And he said, I've been waiting to he hear from you because your phone is not working. And I could make a call out, but he couldn't call in. And he said, <laughs> oh, they've offered you this thing, but the guy who was, you were playing opposite has pulled out. And you've got to go back tomorrow and re-audition. I thought, oh, <laughs> fuck, not again. And he said, yeah, they're bringing back Paul McGann. And so that's how it happened. Wow. Anyway. And your phone really was broken? Because that's the kind of thing that you worry about hugely when you're waiting for a call. Well, I don't understand, because I thought <laughs> if, you, if a phone is fucked, you can't phone. You <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> If the phone is technically broken down, <laughs> you can either phone in or you phone out. I didn't realize it's sort of one way. It's sort of mm. like thinking that your knob could stay down or only go up or only stay up or not go down. You know what I mean? <laughs> it doesn't kind of work like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is being filmed. I do worry. <laughs> yeah. It'll be an 18 certificate. Okay. Um, so, so it was your, not only your, your first film, but the first film you'd even really auditioned for, and it was yeah, Bruce, the only Bruce, film Robinson, I'd Bruce Robinson's for. first film as well. So yeah. there must have been a, a certain amount of nervousness, anxiety on the set, or did it feel as if it came there together? There was no anxiety, moment? because um, apart from the, f the very first day, when Dennis O'Brien, who was, I think, a six foot six, completely bald, no disrespect to any bald men here, and I'm heading that way fast myself, but he was completely bald like an egg, and he announced before lunchtime that he tore a page out of the script, which is the bull scene, if you've seen the film. Um, and he said, you're already behind schedule, and this thing's not funny. And then he saw the rushes after the first day, and he said, it should be like, it should be brightly lit, like a Monty Python film, and my character should be like Kenneth Williams, throwing my arms around and all this stuff. Mm. So Bruce said to him, called his bluff at lunchtime, and said, oh, will I walk out? And again, it was like with Michael Maloney in the, in the tube stop. I said, Bruce, you can't go. I've told everybody I'm going to be in a film. You can't fucking do this to me. I can't not, I can't lie. And as I thought it was going out the window. Anyway, they got rid of, they got the, the producer out of the way. And they found out that he had embezzled a huge amount of George Harrison's money. And he's still on the run, even though George is now dead, somewhere floating around the Caribbean. So whoever knows this fucker, Dennis O'Brien, get him. <laughs> he still owes Bruce money. So we didn't, he didn't relight the film and have me flailing around like Kenneth Williams, but um, so 
that's what happened. But that's interesting because... So that was the big tension, otherwise yeah. we were left alone. It seems as if the fact that Bruce Robinson stuck to his guns there and knew what he wanted, even though the producers had a sort of different vision of it, resulted Only in Only one it. producer. One producer. George Harrison was now absolutely was behind it. One. Right. But that, that maybe helped it to end up being the idiosyncratic thing. It makes you wonder how many other films have people have succumbed and changed what they were doing and you've ended up with a much worse film. Maybe one of the reasons this is so treasured is because it was people sticking to their guns of what they knew they wanted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. But you know, having said that, at the time, Crocodile Dundee was the big film of that year. Uh, Fergie got married to Porky. Um, <laughs> I mean, Prince, what's his face? Andrew. Um, <laughs> Prince Andrew, sorry. <laughs> Don't apologize, it's fine. Our great business ambassador to the uh, <laughs> wide world. Anyway, he, um, so that was what was going on in 1986. Uh, so the idea that a film with an unpronounceable title, people in it who nobody ever heard of, no women, no car chases, and certainly no crocodiles, it seemed as unlikely a prospect as anything. Mm -hmm. So we were told right at the beginning, well, the title's got to change. Um, and there was a lot of talk and rumor that it would never be released. Mm. So between that and Dennis O'Brien coming on the first day, I was in a state of perpetual high anxiety and sphincter winking terror <laughs> that it would never come out. <laughs> anyway, here I am, <laughs> calm and collected, <laughs> at 60, 30 years on. But even when it came out, I think it's easy for us to imagine now that a film like that comes out and is the, the sort of cult hit is an instantaneous ready-made thing, but that wasn't really the case, was it? it no, it lasted four weeks in the cinema and then was gone. Yeah. And then disappeared and it got pretty mediocre reviews. Um, and it was an enormous pleasure to me and especially Bruce Robinson when it was re-reviewed 20 years later mm. and they said, oh, it's like a fine wine. It's, a, you know, it's, it's <laughs> developed. And you think, no, it's not. It's yeah. the same thing that it always was. It hasn't changed. You've changed, you fuckwit. <laughs> so, um, well, you know, Jesus. <laughs> One particular critic from Time Out, whose name I won't mention, but his <laughs> initials are G.A. Gonad mean. illiterate. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, he re-reviewed, and I thought, what a fucking arsehole, that he could think that something had transformed. It's like saying, oh, yes, this, is, this plastic bottle has aged beautifully in 20 years' time. No, it's not. It's still the same thing that could kill a whale. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll keep calm. No, it's, it's understandable because there's something that, that seemed so sort of fragile at the beginning to have people embrace it and then insist that they'd embraced it from the beginning. I can see. But is, is it strange that people now feel such a connection to it and that people still will reel off screeds of the dialogue and things? I have no comprehension of why that is, why that is so. But I mean, I know about movies that I'm obsessed with that I know dialogue of by heart. But why this one, I, it, it's a mystery to me. Really? And it's a mystery to all of us, I think, who, who are in it. Because I've discussed it with uh, Ralph Brown and Richard Griffiths, late R R Richard Griffiths, and Paul McGann and Bruce Robinson. And, you know, people have written theses on <laughs> various tracts about why they think that it is. I, you know, I think it's very, f the script is wonderfully funny and it's very accurate and true to what being unemployed as an actor is like, mm. but why that should reach as many people on the cult level that it has done, um, I, don't, I don't really have an answer to that. Mm. And what about what happened after that? Did that, you, you came out of that with expectations or in need of something different? What I thought that if the film came out at all, I would get another job from it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I'd be working in a theatre because uh, Paul McGann said to me in the first, at the end of the shoot, he said, well, you know, you have no real chance of making it. I said, why not? He said, you're too tall. <laughs> he said, all great, all great movie stars are under five foot ten. And then he listed a whole lot of people. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but what about Clint Eastwood and, you know, these other guys that are over six foot ten or whatever? And he <laughs> said, oh, no, no, you didn't count them. But I think he was just winding me up. <laughs> you go away determined to become shorter. Yeah. <laughs> So then um, you did work with Bruce Robinson again, not, not that long after in How to Get Ahead in Advertising, was that? Yeah, and again, he'd offered, he'd offered that part because I then got this part in a Hollywood movie called Warlock. Um, That's a cult classic. <laughs> and, uh, well, it had been produced by Arnold Copelson, who'd, who'd just done, won the Oscar for Platoon, and Sean Connery had turned down this part of the, the Warlock Hunter. Then it went to Michael Douglas. 
then they thought, well, fuck it, they, they, they're just going to get somebody unknown who's really cheap, <laughs> me, after they'd seen Withner, which was released there before it came out here. But we'll retain the Scottish accent part of the offer to mm. Sean Connery. So <laughs> my fantastic Scottish ac accent is on record in this film. Um, and, and because the, the producer of How to Get Ahead in Advertising then claimed that I had that I had reneged on my deal with Bruce Robinson, as if I would, and had gone and done this film instead. Mm. So I wasn't available when they um. were going to shoot it. So again, the fuckers offered it to Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and because Bruce had been so vituperative and saying, well, Richard E. Grant is much better than Daniel Day-Lewis could have ever been for the part, Daniel Day-Lewis, when he got the off on the, on the how to get an head in advertising, told him to fuck off. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so two times lucky. So when I finally, I had a small part in Age of Innocence. And uh, when I met Daniel on the first day, when he was still speaking to me before he went into method and didn't speak to anybody, um, seriously, um, I literally got into Winnie Baker, because I was summoned, and I lay down on the floor and I said, thank you, oh, Daniel, for turning down both these films. And he said, arise, my boy. <laughs> so I'm very grateful to him. So, and I'm sorry that he's retired, because he's absolutely brilliant. Didn't he retire before and then come back again to do There Will Be Blood, though? It might. You mean he's going to be like Frank Sinatra? Yeah, he's going to the comeback tour. Coming back, yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't know. And subsequent to that, uh, you, you did some interesting movies and set up some interesting connections. L.A. Story br brought you a, a friendship with Steve Martin yeah. that he has talked about very entertainingly and that you used to exchange long faxes, I believe, where you would uh, let off steam about the people that you'd worked with. Yeah, well, no, we still do that, but it's now gone to email. I was going to say, do you still have fax machines just for each other? Cause that's yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, no, he's, he apparently has got a, a sort of wedge of stuff like that that I live in terror of <laughs> being published. <laughs> so I've made a deal with my daughter and just said, if he publishes this, I will have to be in my box and burnt <laughs> before, because otherwise there'll be lawsuits. <laughs> what I've said about certain people that you may have heard of in this room, no, not in this room, <laughs> that you in this room would have heard of. <laughs> Considering what you've already said in this room, I can't imagine what Steve Martin's got. But <laughs> oh, believe me. <laughs> no, do you know that, that thing where you're working on something that you can, you know, you can even say it about your best friend. I know none of you kind-hearted um, <laughs> Quakers in this church <laughs> would say this, but you know, you can walk out and say, "For fuck's sake, this person driven me up the night," you know, or they smell, or they said something that's really annoyed you. And then a day later, if you don't write that down, you think, "God, this person will never speak to you again." And the day later, you go, "Yeah, well, it's just." But your you friend. do write it down. You have I it all do. in your diary. <laughs> I do, so be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can see that the diary writing thing gives you this amazing record of everything that you've done, but there's also, like you say, there's a danger in recording feelings in the moment because years later, has it ever come back to bite you? Did anyone read with nails and come back and say to you, I can't believe what you said about me? I'm not going to tell you who, but yes, one person did. And the weird thing about publishing a diary is that uh, even though they are edited by somebody that takes out the stuff that they think is going to cause libel problems, that people's memory of the same event are different. Yeah. Somebody wrote to me in all seriousness and said, oh, you describe me as wearing a red pullover or red cardigan in this, and it was aubergine. And you go, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> you know, I thought, this has warranted an entire letter about that. There's no index in the book, so if you look up <laughs> aubergine or red, it won't appear. Um, but that is the thing. You know, it would be like if, if, I don't know how many people are in here, 90 people wrote about mm -hmm what this experience was tonight, you would probably get very different mm -hmm. things. Mm. You know. So what is accurate? I no, don't know. Indeed. Do you think this thing of, of recording the experiences and, and writing about them, is that what your father said about you, that your brain is too big for the challenges of acting and that you need more? No, I'm just a nosy on? parker. <laughs> and I'm also hyper curious about stuff. And what people do and how they operate is absolutely the lifeblood of what I find interesting. So. Uh, what's fascinating now for me is that if you go in a restaurant or you sit in a bus or whatever on the tube, n you can stare at people absolutely blatantly because they're all here like this, <laughs> doing that. And you can yeah. really have a good old, <laughs> you can walk around people and literally do that. And they don't notice. I've been up to people and sniffed them and think, my God. <laughs> and they're just like this. Just, you know, so. For me, that's a great advantage. <laughs> I love that. 
<laughs> yeah, I must be a sort of voyeur or sniffing sniffer. Sniffing the public, a sniffer. Yeah. <laughs> So when, when you did come on to these very, very big movies like The Player and Bram Stoker's Dracula with these huge star casts and a very different scale of operation than, than the stuff, than, than with Mail and How to Get Ahead in Advertising, yeah. what was that like? Was that intimidating? Did it feel like where you'd wanted to be all along? Was it a very different type of professional experience? Well, well that's a great question because in the d case of those three directors, Altman, Coppola and Scorsese, who I'd absolutely worship because all their indie movies that they'd made or indie movies, their, their, their heyday movies, had been in the 1970s, mm -hmm. before Jaws changed mm -hmm. everything into a tentpole, has to take a gazillion dollars in the first weekend movies. Um, so they as the, them, th those three directors were such huge, iconic figures that they outshone any, any star power that the, the, the casts right. had. And the curious thing about them is that it united everybody in that mm. way. So from Michelle Pfeiffer to Julia Roberts or whoever they were name dropping, everybody was thrilled to be because they were working with Robert Altman mm. or Coppola or Scorsese. Yeah. So the fact that Lauren Bacall was next to you in the makeup van, you kind of go, yeah, that's Lauren Bacall, <laughs> but it's Robert Altman that we were all in, in awe of. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, I think that sort of under, you know, reduced everything. And because Altman works in a completely democratic way, and he dispenses with all movie trailers so that he don't, doesn't waste money on that right. and people sort of measuring their dick size on how big their Winnebago's <laughs> are or what a bra size would have you called <laughs> figuratively, that everybody's in the same marquee, the same, you queue up at the same um, pop-up table for makeup. Mm -hmm. So you could be standing behind Sof Sophia Loren or Julia Roberts or Lyle Lovett or whoever they were. There was no, all that hierarchy he dispensed with. Right. And that was, I think, part of his genius. Mm -hmm. He was also very shrewd because it meant that all the salaries were on two tiers. So on Gosford Park, there was one level, all the knights and the dames got the higher level and all the middling lot, like me and the others, got the middle salary and then the serfs got a lower one. <laughs> um, but the, the, the difference in salary was so relatively small that you, you never had a situation where you could have somebody getting paid $50 million and somebody else getting paid absolutely fuck all. Mm. Where that is what is intimidating, when people are in a caravan and surrounded by an entourage and you feel you can't just have a normal conversation. You want to go, hello, you're an actor. You began with the same amount of talent as everybody else um, before you became this phenomenon that has, has to be surrounded by all that, sh that stuff. Mm -hmm. And usually, in my experience, the more of that accrues around the person, the worse their talent becomes. It, they get corrupted mm -hmm. by that. And the, the absolute exception to that is Meryl Streep who had Roy J. Helland, um, who is her makeup artist, who's worked with her her entire career. And that is the only person that you see around her. Mm. So in the green room or in the studio when we were doing The Iron Lady, even though we all had tiny parts, she'd be in a room like this and she'd just sit and talk to everybody. Whereas somebody else, <laughs> Kim Basinger, <laughs> might require a driver and a bodyguard and a chef and all the shit that goes on that, that isolates and insulates you from the real world right. and from other actors. So I think it's self-defeating finally. Mm. Um, you know, I, I despair of hearing actors now that have a huge entourage and an earpiece where they don't even have to learn their lines. So that, you know, you, you do your, you know, you say your stuff and then you wait. And yeah, then you go, people do that. Oh, yeah, I could name three people right now. Go on. No, I won't, <laughs> because you can read about them on the internet. But I find, it, I find it insulting to another actor. I understand if you're very old, and I'm heading there fast, <laughs> where you can't remember the lines and somebody's feeding to you. That I get. But, but, you know, if you're under the age of whatever, 65 or 70, to actually not have the courtesy to, because a film script is always, the amount of dialogue you have on a day is very sh short. Yeah. It's not like doing a play. Yeah. Um, you know, the least you can do is learn it. So getting paid a gazillion dollars <laughs> and then having an earpiece, you just think, well, you know, what's the point of it? Anyway, I've blathered on. No, I'm sorry. Oh, that's what you're here for. So, so the fact that these, these relatively early in your career, these films with these colossally important and influential directors, they were all quite big sort of ensemble cast. These were all directors that you were in awe of rather yeah. than being in awe of the self. Do you think that sort of helped you to ease into a, another level of celebrity yourself, another level <coughs> of kind of 
being recognised, that you'd that you'd witnessed this onset behaviour that maybe wasn't as obnoxious as some of what you're describing? I honestly think that that I've never had the, that kind of fame that that you're talking about, um, or I think you're talking about. And also, growing up where I did, where there's tall poppy syndrome that you can't mm. think that you're anybody fancy or get above yourself. That was so sort of ingrained in my brain. And also that the, the, the recognition I got, if you like, um, came so slowly and gradually. Mm -hmm. And the as the first film I was in only came out when I turned 30. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, I saw Winona Ryder when she was 19 years old, who had the power at that point, which is inconceivable now, mm -hmm. post shoplifting. Um, <laughs> she had the power to take a script of Dracula and say, I want Francis Ford Coppola to direct it. You think this is the guy who's done The Godfathers and Apocalypse Now, and his career had sort of gone into a fallow period, and Winona had the star power at 19 years old to turn that around, mm. which is astonishing. Mm -hmm. So, and you, when that amount of attention and money is accrued around you, which doesn't happen in Britain in the same way, because we just don't have the finances for mm. actors like that, I don't think. Um, for somebody to keep a, a calm head and a normal head in the midst of that, I think is almost impossible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, I understand why people get very aberrant behavior. Yeah. And they've got to have goji berries, you know, <laughs> propped up their ass <laughs> on a sort of half alley basis. <laughs> yeah. Who was that? <laughs> Me. <laughs> Oh, I've mentioned arses and rectums so many times all right already, so already. I must have some <laughs> anal fixation. I'm so sorry. Did you find from working with these directors, and presumably there were other experiences around this time that were less positive in terms of the directors you were working with, did you find that it changed your approach to acting? Was it a learning experience for you, how you approached a role? Uh, yes, but I think that... What you, because on films, you're given so little direction mm -hmm. for, the, for the most part, that when you're given bad direction, I'm always put in mind of what my grandmother did with my grandfather. Uh, she used to listen to everything he said and say, yes, I absolutely agree. Yes, that's wonderful. And then she'd do exactly what she was gonna do anyway. <laughs> so I think that if you say, that's a brilliant idea, thank you so much for that wonderful note, and then you absolutely ignore it because it's so bad. Um, <laughs> If you can somehow convince them that you're doing something and show that it's better, because sometimes they they will give you a direction and you go, that's not the right direction that's going to help me, but clearly you've identified that there's something wrong with this bit, so try and find a way around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the theatre you have time to you know sit and analyse stuff, but in a movie it's yeah. you know you the death scene in the morning, the fuck scene in the yeah. afternoon, the bridal the next day, and it's you know there's. <laughs> There isn't really a amount of time because there's so many people involved and so much money and pressure that th th the luxury of rehearsing is the first thing that is dispensed mm. with. So you have to come in very prepared and open to whatever's going on, mm -hmm. I think. I always think that's a strange thing about cinema that even people who watch cinema a lot or who are quite expert in cinema you still find surprising when you really think about it that films are shot out of sequence oh, yeah. and that you don't rehearse and that it's all so bitty because, you know it's a sign of the magic of film that it all f usually flows together so well and that you can't tell that the scenes are shot out of sequence. But yeah. I always imagine that, for, especially for an actor coming out of theatre, that must be quite a hard thing to get used to. But it prepares you so mm. that you know that you've, because as they've, like, like on movies, they've squeezed rehearsal times in the theatre because of money constraints so mm. much that I've just done My Fair Lady at the Chicago Opera House and they, you know, it's a three hour musical with huge numbers and songs and set changes and all this stuff, they gave this company three weeks to do it. Now, the original production took, I think, nine weeks to rehearse mm -hmm. in 1956. Um, so what happens is that you've got to know every song and every line of dialogue before the first day of rehearsal, mm -hmm. because otherwise that concertina of time, it would be impossible mm -hmm. if you turn up with the book on the first day. So essentially that is much like the movies in a much more concentrated form, mm -hmm. except that you don't have to do the three hours in one go. You know, you usually have, at the most, five or six pages. Mm -hmm. Although in How to Get Ahead in Advertising, there are about 11 pages a day of dialogue. Mm -hmm. So 
um, that sadist <laughs> Bruce Robinson was very insistent that not a comma was changed or not an apostrophe was ignored. So that had to be rehearsed in advance. So theatre training does help you for yeah. that. You, you spoke with some passion about some of the early reviews of, of With Nell and I. Did you, have you continued to be engaged with sort of what critics say or what critics think? Yeah, well, the, the thing that I was most taken aback by in, at the beginning was they described what I look like. Mm. And that is a weird thing. It's weird to see yourself for the first mm. time. It's a bit like I would imagine if you filmed yourself having sex and you didn't, and then you watched it back and you're like, oh my God, that's not what it felt like. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you listen to yourself on a tape recorder the first time you go, that's not yeah. what I sound like. It's very, it's unnatural to see yourself or to hear yourself. So I was described as lantern-jawed, tombstone-featured, oh. all these terrible things. And I thought, Jesus Christ, I know, you know, I'm not that ugly. So um, <laughs> that was, that took getting used to. Yeah. But and reading stuff, the, the, the worst thing about about reviews, I think, is if you don't read them, which many actors don't do, mm -hmm. and then somebody comes up to you, which has happened to me, and goes, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> you go, what the fuck are they talking about? So I'd rather know. <laughs> I'd rather know if they're really bad. I'd rather know what somebody said. And I also have an elephantine memory, and the critics that have annihilated me, I will dance in their fucking grave. <laughs> I'm a very nice person. <laughs> well, I don't think it's an unreasonable thing, you know. Are there, are there smaller films that you've done that might not be sort of in that top order of famous movies that you retain a, a soft spot for or that you think should have got more attention? It's the friendships that have come out of the films mm. that I think are the things that I value the most because they're the things that, they're the things that last. So I did a film that was called Killing Dad with Julie Waters and the late Denham Elliott. It came out for four days in the Shaftesbury Avenue Cinema in London. It was on DVD, or on video, two weeks later, which was a record. <laughs> Nobody went to see it. But my friendship with Julie and the time that I had with her on that, and her doing Acorn Antiques impressions on a daily basis, playing Mrs. Overall, that, that has annihilated what the film was like for me completely. So, you know, that, that she's just been deigned is so fantastic <laughs> news to me, and uh, hopefully everybody else, that that's, that is what I count. But, um, and it's unavailable in any shape <laughs> or format, so you can't even look it up. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going home to look for it now. <laughs> Because I was thinking of a film called Jack and Sarah yeah. that I loved and that I don't hear people mentioning very often, but I think this is a very rare film in the sense of being a film about fatherhood, parenthood generally. It's a film in which the, the father's relationship with the child is preceded by a terrible tragedy, but it's also just to me about the great sort of shock of parenthood and the, the change that it affects in people. And that's one of my favorite performances of yours. Do you? Oh, thank are you, you. Are you going to tell me that you hate it now or something? No, I don't, <laughs> I don't hate it at all. And I'm still great friends with the director. Um, but that film is shown on, on the cable channels in England almost on a monthly basis. So I know from emails or Twitter things that I get that it is still out there. Um, so it's not as obscure as I think you think Good. it is. I, just I, from what the feedback that I get from people. I kept mentioning it to people when well, I, I did had have small a big babies. Mullet. I'm just like Richard E. Grant in Jack and Sarah. I don't oh, know what I'm there doing. you go. <laughs> <laughs> what about um, working with Jane Campion and Nicole Kidman on Portrait of a Lady? Jane Campion is an alpha male. <laughs> so I have this theory about masculine, 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 feminine, feminine, masculine, whatever, which is the predominant in somebody's character. Mm -hmm. And Jane Campion is essentially masculine, masculine. So I, as a feminine, masculine man myself, <laughs> I knew that I had to get my fictitious ovaries right out <laughs> when I worked with her. And, and I sort of basically turned into a, even a bigger girl than I already am. <laughs> um, so I found that was the best way to deal with her. Whereas John Malkovich, who is masculine, masculine, she and Jane Campion, it was literally like watching two stags, wow. horns just locked. Yeah. And they were, you know, it was like that. So I knew that that's what would have happened if I tried to butch up. Um, <laughs> but, so I did like working with her enormously, but she is, she is a very powerful, dominant, uh, masculine, masculine person. And nothing to do with the person's sexuality. It's just what I perceive as their what, 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 it helps me understand what and how you're dealing with somebody. Right. I, I, I want to ask you about everyone you've worked with in terms of their masculine and feminineness now. What about Madonna? 
triple masculine. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why she and Guy Ritchie, who's double masculine, it, it, it can't work. Wow. Yeah. It's a whole theory. What about the Spice Girls? Because you were in Spice World. Well, a Victoria, Spice is masculine feminine, <laughs> and David Beckham is feminine masculine, right? It's obvious. It's obvious. He is, completely, and that's why it works. And Jerry Hallowell's feminine feminine, and your husband's masculine masculine. <laughs> What about doing a film like that, that that met with quite a bit of scorn and mockery? Did was that? I don't give a it? fuck. <laughs> no, I have no shame about that. But I have to put it in the context. My daughter was eight years old. It was still answer machine days with little blinking <laughs> messages, and I came home and she got home from school and she said she'd play the answer machine. She could work out how to do that, and she said, "Dad, your agent has called. They said you want to be in the play the manager in the Spice wo Spice Girls movie. You have to be in it." <laughs> So, of course, they paid me a lot of money, and I knew that I just turned 40, they were all 20, and, you know, <laughs> pinching my bahookie on a daily basis. <laughs> well, it was just fantastic. And my daughter could bring her friends to the set. Um, fast forward 20 years later, because we shot this 20 years ago, um, wow. and uh, Lena Dunham wrote me a part in Girls, which went over four episodes, because of seeing me in Spice really? World. And Adele gave me tickets to go and see her sold out show because she's a Spice World fan. So fuck them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I loved it. You know, I knew that, it, you know, it wasn't Martin Scorsese or, you know, what it was. It's just one of those sort of ridiculous things like the Beatles movies. Not that I'm saying the Spice Girls are like the Beatles, but it's just a thing that is made just for the sheer of mm -hmm. doing it. And also to make money. Mm. But it's, so I love doing it. Yeah. And I had a really good time, and I got a great bunch of sort of satin suits out of the whole <laughs> thing that are in my loft. Which I'm going to eBay. You, <laughs> you mentioned girls. You obviously wanted me to feel ashamed about not Spice Girls. No, I exactly had many people in the profession, in my profession, who got very high and mighty, hoity toity, saying, Oh, you've worked with the Spice Girls. How could you lower yourself? And I said, Easily. <laughs> Easily. <laughs> I said, were you offered a part? No. Would you if you had been offered? And they said no. And I said, well, you're lost. So. <laughs> Was that Daniel Day-Lewis saying that? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about TV. Your, your career in TV has kind of spanned this very interesting period that we've seen of television becoming much higher production values, more sort of critical credibility, arguably much bigger stars going into work on television. Is, it, is that a change that you've sort of been aware of in the work that you've done on TV, or has it? Yeah, because all the, the I think the, the character-driven stuff that used to, be, used to be in movies, and especially in what we now consider indie movies, that has, all those writers and those actors have now migrated mm. Um, into television because you get a chance to develop a character and you know the box set stuff and the stuff that's on Netflix I think it's absolutely phenomenal whereas the the so many of the big tentpole movies that you see now are so CGI laden mm -hmm. and essentially it seems to me boils down to famous people running away from or towards explosions of what some form or another or they're in a Marvel comic world which as an actor I despair of that because how difficult is it to put on a suit and you know fancy makeup and be flung around, you know, an imaginary world? You know, I'm sure it's entertaining for a short amount of uh, for the time that you're watching it. But whether they have real resonance and touch people, mm -hmm. I d I genuinely doubt that they do, mm -hmm. which I think is why people gravitate to eventually to things that are about the human condition mm -hmm. what me and mean something without getting pretentious. Mm -hmm. And you can do that on long form. Um, television. So I think that television at the moment, in the, uh, for the last five or six years, or maybe even longer, is that the quality of it is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And very different things that you were working on, from you know Downton Abbey to Girls, very different atmospheres. But that same kind of sense of being able to get to know a character over a, over a period of time. What about the Downton Abbey phenomenon? Well, Downton Abbey was like going to boarding school because <laughs> they were all so bored doing it. Well, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> they were, um, they had been habituated <laughs> into doing this. And, you know, for an actor, you're so used to living this peripatetic life where you go from one job to another or hoping for another job to come along. So that sort of hunger and appetite is always omnipresent. Um, but if you're in a job where you know that you're going to be in it for 
a year or two years or even three or four years as it mm. turned out. You know everybody's stories, you know what everybody's doing. So new blood coming in, there's a sort of shark-like atmosphere yeah. like, oh, you're new. <laughs> you know, come and tell us your stories and bring some new blood in. Yeah. And that wears off fairly fast. I did four episodes and by the fourth episode it was like, oh, hi, yeah, <laughs> yeah you're back. So it was a bit like that, but you know, I, was, I really enjoyed doing it trying to jump Lady Cora, especially <laughs> I'd played a husband in the Scarlet Pimpernel 20 years before. So, um, yeah, it was, I enjoyed doing that. Although Hugh Bonneville, who I'd known for a long time, um, and is a little bit more well upholstered than I am, um, he, had to, he had to punch me and then fall on top of me in his bedroom. And I think on the 16th take of, of doing this, he landed on this rib cage here and cracked a rib, and I was in absolute agony. So, and because you can't, you can't have them fixed by a doctor. And so he, I have this against him <laughs> at all times. But he said, well, you know, you did try and jump my wife in the story. So, you know, <laughs> fair news. Uh, the TV world, you've now got Game of Thrones to add to this as well. The TV world has this huge exposure and enters the lives of people who might not have chosen to go to the movies and see a film. So right. you have, and now you have this very sort of active, shall we say, online critique of TV shows, and Girls and Game of Thrones and Downton Abbey all have this huge amount of following, slightly obsessive following, possibly, mm -hmm. online. Is that something that, that enters your consciousness? Do you feel exposed by that sort of...? No, because my part in all those three huge series was so small that, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that didn't happen, no. And ironically, they've never killed off any of the characters that I played. So I've, I've, you know, I've said oh, to all of them, so the Game of Thrones guys, I said, you know, I'm not dead. I can come back. And they said, no, no, we're done with you. <laughs> <laughs> Down to now, they're now stopped, and Girls is now stopped. But I did keep flagging up. I say, you know, I'm not dead. The character's not dead. So clearly, I just outstayed my welcome mat. <laughs> and let, we're going to go to the audience soon, but let's talk a little about Wawa and about what must have been, well, I'm assuming a, a somewhat intimidating experience for you in that this was quite an exposing thing. This was talking about your own early life and some quite personal material, but also your first directorial film and, you know, actors who make films, there's a whole other level of attention on their abilities as directors. How did that feel to put that out into the world? Uh, I had a situation, well, situation, I had this thing where ever since I'd emigrated to England and anybody who'd asked about my background, and when I told them bits and pieces, they s I kept being told over the years, you could either write a book about it or you could try and make a movie or a play about it. Um, so that's, I got encouraged, I realized that perhaps the story that I'd had and the exotic setting of it relative to you know, the green and rolling hills mm. of the UK um, would, would be of interest to, s to somebody. So that's really what galvanized me to actually have the courage to, to do it. And also, I think, more than anything, there's, you try and, in trying from the advantage of middle age and post-psychoanalysis, <laughs> to understand how your own history has come about. So I, sp I you know, acknowledge that it's very egocentric to do that, <laughs> and a great luxury, to actually make a film and to examine it and be the director and writer in control of it in middle age, whereas a child or an, as an adolescent as I was, um, so I'm now th frothing like an old man, um, uh, you, you, you have no control. So to be able to go back in middle age right. to the actual locations where it was all happened, right. in the country where it happened, was an amazingly cathartic and healing process. So I love doing it. And also, if you're a detail freak and um, obsessive about stuff, which I am, um, it's the perfect job because on a daily basis, you're asked, while you're directing something, a hundred questions. Mm -hmm. You're asked, will you wear that blouse? Where do you want these bottles? Is the microphone mm -hmm. there or the chair should be there? Should all these people be dressed like this? So being asked all that and providing answers, should these be green or open or whatever? Is it too badly lit or... I loved answering all those questions. Where it drives some people nuts, I love that. Right. And in a way, that's the control that you don't always have as an actor. You have no control yeah. as an actor, other than to say, yes, I will do the job, or no, I won't. Yeah. Because how you're cut or directed or edited or whatever is in somebody else's hands and power. And you, you really have no power over that or control over that more than anything. Um, so writing and directing something, you do. You then also, on the flip side, 
that if it doesn't work, you're carrying you're the carrying can for that. Mm -hmm. But it's also incredibly collaborative that you, you had a crew of 120 people. So y you rely on people who are absolutely brilliant at what they do in mm -hmm. their jobs. And mm -hmm. so that, that is a, an enormous gift as well. Mm -hmm. and did so it I'm sounding an American now. It's an enormous <laughs> gift. <laughs> We're so privileged. So, so it's a great thrill, should I say. And putting it out into the world to audiences, was that nerve wracking or did you feel confident that you'd done what you wanted? Because, because I did previews, um, during the editing process, I found out what d didn't work and mm -hmm. what did work. I mean, for instance, m my father's funeral, there was a young priest called Becky Gumedze who had done an evangelical course in the USA, and he spoke at my father, he was the priest at my father's funeral, and he got it into his head that he could raise people from the dead. So he jumped into my father's grave, undid the coffin, opened it up, and there was my father, you know, dead, 52 years old, weighed 60 pounds. Um, and he tried to make him rise from the dead. So he then, then other people climbed into the grave to try and console him and get him out before my father could be buried. So I filmed that. And when we showed it in the preview to a uh, test audience about, you know, group of 60 people, People said, it, it is so fucking weird and so out there and it, it's so jolting that they couldn't take it. So there was a situation of something that actually happened, mm. perfectly recreated, which the audience couldn't accept. So he just got buried as normal. Um, but in the DVD extra, you can see a bit <laughs> of that. Um, you know, so that, that was a situation of, is that answering your question? Yeah, no, that's, in, that's sort of taking it somewhere else, which is more interesting, which is that it's almost reality needing to be toned down. To yeah, yeah, so that's, that happened in that. And did it fill you with the desire to do more of it? Yeah, yeah, and I've had three other projects that came within four weeks of starting shooting, also independent films that I hadn't written, but I had worked on and co-developed. Um, and then the finances fell through, mm -hmm. and I got so dispirited by that that... Um, it coincided with somebody meeting me on holiday in the Caribbean and seeing that I can possibly sniffed everything and said, why don't you make your own perfume? So I've become a perfumier <laughs> uh, for the last three years, which you earn quite a lot of money from and it, you can make in your own kitchen and then you have cr creative and complete control over it. Um, whereas in a movie, you don't. So that, that's what I've done. So I haven't <coughs> attempted in the last four years to make another movie on my own. And um, the perfume thing, how, what, what, uh, I know you, you have mentioned smelling people in public a bit. What, is this something you'd always wanted to do? Had you always been Well, I've always done it, and I never understood why everybody doesn't do it. I mean, I don't go up to people's crotches, <laughs> like dogs. But, you know, I've always sniffed everything, and I, my father said, you know, you, you can't really do this. This is not normal <laughs> behavior. And I said, well, we're animals. He said, no, we're not. And I, my school teacher said, yes, we are all animals. So I went back to him and I said, we're animals. So he said, well, can you just temper it down, not smell your food or lick your plate like a dog? So I tried for a bit, but didn't, you know, didn't succeed. Um, if anybody who's seen Hotel Secrets will know that that's what I do. So, you know, th I then tried to make perfume and scent for a girl that I had a mad crush on when I was 12 years old, um, out of gardenia and rose petals boiled up in sugar water and germ jars buried in the garden. Um, and then it took me another 40 years to actually do it professionally. <laughs> So, you know, that's, um, what's that's a great passion. What does it smell like? What are the top notes? Lime, marijuana, mandarin is the first <laughs> really? one. Really? Yep, yep. The second one, Jack Covent Garden, is uh, rose, ginger, carrot, musk. And the third one, which is Jack Piccadilly, 69, as in sex position, and the year 1969, Thank you. is a miniature of this, and that is uh, bergamot, leather, patchouli, petrol, and amber. Petrol, really? Yeah. I need to let it develop, don't I? It's, it's very nice. You could nice. do. I may attack you if you keep doing that. <laughs> it's very sexual. <laughs> and it's available online. <laughs> my, God, my that smells so fucking good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> let's see if anyone has any questions. If not, you can all go home. If not, you can you know, just leave us. Um, right. Nobody. Have we got a microphone? I'm just checking. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, so it's small. Shout. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hi. Just Hi. trying to work out if there's. Is there a roving mic in the audience? Can someone shout at me? No. No. Okay, we'll just need to shout loudly. I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We'll start with you, love. Hi. 
And you. Hands up if you can hear. People can hear. Okay, that's okay. Good. There's some deaf people. Um, okay. <laughs> Do you prefer film acting or theater acting? They are. It's. It comes down to the same thing. You either believe what you're saying and people believe what you're doing, or they don't. And the the advantage of doing a film is you get paid much more money, and there is a <laughs> record, for better or worse, of it afterwards. Whereas the theater is completely ephemeral. You know, I've just done My Fair Lady, as I said, in Chicago. Excuse me, I'm burping now. There's no, there's no, th I have no record of it whatsoever, which is maybe a good thing, but you, you don't have it. Um, whereas in film, even if you have to do 20 takes of something of just doing that 20 times, you won't have to ever do that again because it's done and it's, and it's finished. So, but the, the, the advantage of doing a theater is that you do have, you know, from the beginning of the end, you go through the whole process of playing that character as opposed to just bits. And what is very frustrating about filming is that if you do a bit, there was a, there, there was a, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, what is the thing? Sword fighting, foil scene fencing. in Withnail. Fencing, thank you, old age, <laughs> senior <laughs> moment, um, which you would understand. Um, <laughs> uh, well, you've got gray hair, so I understand. I know, we're part of the same brethren. I know you're not 21 anymore. So, yeah. How old are you? How old are you? 64. Still got your own hair and teeth? 66. You've missed 65 and you're on to 66. You will be. I hope to be 66 one day. <laughs> no, but that, the thing is that, oh, the fencing scene in Withner and I was, was cut. And I, I remember so enjoying doing it. And I know that, you know, when it's cut out, you have no control over that anymore. So, whereas in the theatre, you, you do. But, you know, so it's one or the other. There was someone right up the back. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for your question. <laughs> I am a perfume ponce. Um, uh, Richard Griffiths, he was an extraordinary human being because he could quote huge reams of poetry and Shakespeare and his knowledge of things was, I mean, he could sort of out Stephen Fry, Stephen Fry. He was an extraordinary intellect and just a naturally gifted storyteller. The only problem was that is that the stories never ended. So you could go to bed at midnight, and Richard was still telling the story. And you meet him for breakfast, and he had three portions to everybody else's, as you could see. And he would just carry on the story as though no time had gone in between, which is a sort of fantastic Irish quality, if that doesn't sound racist to say. Um, and, but what happened with him is that he'd been doing a film in uh, Italy, and he came straight to Penrith for that the end of the first week that Paul and I were in the Cumbrian cottage. And we started off with a scene which was a Sunday lunch scene in which there was, had to eat leg of lamb and roast potatoes and drink all this Ribena for me. Um, and because my character hadn't eaten for three days, um, I had to eat very, very fast and sort of stuff my face and drink the whole, the whole way through. <laughs> and Richard hadn't really learned his lines properly because he wasn't in any of the rehearsals. So he kept blobbing on the lines and telling us stories in between. And I was going, just eating this stuff, eating this stuff. They eventually had to have a vomit bucket because I ate three legs of lamb, I don't know, eight kilos of potatoes. I couldn't fit it down anymore. And I also weighed ten and a half stone, according to the sadist director, saying, you have to be even thinner than you already are. Because he said, you've got a very fat face when he first saw me. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> and uh, he said, you look like a fat dirt bogard, <laughs> pulling his mouth down like that. Anyway. So <laughs> that's what happened on that. So Richard, so Richard turned me off eating lamb ever again. <laughs> uh, and especially there were lambs bleating away on the hillside outside the window where we were shooting. But that finished me off lamb for life. <laughs> but um, I loved Richard and I'm very, you know, I'm just sorry that he's not here to enjoy the 30th anniversary as he should be for this. So, you know, bless you wherever you are. But thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. You sound very masculine, masculine. <laughs> Good evening, and I've covered in taps, and I've got muscles the size of my thighs. Carry on. 
I come in peace. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the three shows on which you could... Have Are you an actor? Yeah. Occasionally. Yeah. He projects. Uh, you can hear. Yeah. yeah. Downton, Game of Thrones and Girls. Or one you didn't mention, which is another show on which nobody truly dies. Um, you appeared peripherally on Doctor Who in the wilderness years and then more recently twice as the great intelligence in the new show. How was that? They haven't asked me back. Thank you for the question. And uh, I've been a lifelong friend with Peter Capaldi, so I never got to play opposite him as, as his Doctor Who, which I thought was brilliant. So I did it with Matt Smith. Matt Smith, who's a wonderful actor. Um, and I think I was called The Great Intelligence. And that is as much as I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> and it was shot in Cardiff some Christmases ago, but if you prod me, I could try and remember something, but there was fake snow, <laughs> and I wore a top hat and period clothing, which I have done in quite a few things. <laughs> so they sort of, bl yeah, that's all I can remember. But thank you. And the pay was also very dismal. Oh, easy. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, was, that was the biggest shock. That's what I remember thinking, this is the biggest show the BBC has ever had in 50 years, or it's the biggest flagship show that they had, and I was paid squit. Someone just, yes, go ahead. Um, having worked with several very powerful films like The Power of Zero, what would you say they are good at to help the director work with them? Which ones would that be? Are you a director? Uh, soon to be. Okay. <laughs> I'm available. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I worked with John Gilgood just before he died, and I said, what's your advice about being old? He said, cultivate younger friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, come on. Um, no. Uh, being very clear about what you want to say, and there is a, it's a very, very simple technique that my wife knows acutely. Um, it's called actioning, so that you never, you never generalize anything. You don't say, oh, you come into the room and you feel sad, because that's inactive. It's just saying you're sad. You're angry about the fact that this thing isn't filled with vodka or so that is what you feel about that so that everything is very specific and has an action to it um, and I found that it's the most practical way of dealing with something do you walk into a room fast or slow and why do you do that just answering those simple questions which sounds so naff and obvious but they are the m very often the most helpful the most unhelpful is when somebody said and somebody did this to me on Jack and Sarah, the director who'd never directed a film before, Tim Sullivan, who's a very, very nice man, I have to say. But uh, there was a scene where I was in a hospital and Imogen Stubbs, who plays my wife, has died, and I'm now left with a baby. And Judy Dent was playing my mother, and I, I had just gone to see her body, so I was in a, I worked myself up into the complete state of what you do. And Tim Sullivan came in at eight o'clock in the morning and I was already sort of wired up like this and you know, ready to just blub all day long for these takes. And he said, now what has happened here is that your wife has died and you've come into the hospital and he started telling this whole spiel. And Judy Dench just took him aside and said, shut up. <laughs> Look at him. You can see he's already there. You don't need to tell him any of that. And that was just his inexperience and him feeling that as the director, he had to direct, whereas to have the confidence to just go, this person is in that state already, just guide them through is, so less is more is what I'm saying. But thank you for your question. Okay, someone up there, yes. For the perfect weekend, what do you have in mind? <laughs> For the perfect weekend, and which movie would we be watching? I've never met you. <laughs> um, but it would be either the Bally Finn in Ireland or the Gritty Palace on the Grand Canal in Venice. And you could choose the movie. <laughs> and I like very good room service. My wife is going to kill me. <laughs> you know, she's just going to kick my ass. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be rude, but it was a very kind, nice question. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello. Yes, the man with less hair than me on the right. Yeah, so there's a light shining in my face. Go ahead. I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> what is your question? It was a fucking nightmare. <laughs> because the script was going to be, it was a sort of James Bond spoof, is how it was pitched to us and written. It was going to be James Coburn, Sandra Bernhardt was playing, we were playing husband and wife. And it seemed on paper, and Dan Waters, who'd just done Heathers, an indie movie with a big budget, Joel Silver was producing it. We all went into it, as you do in every movie, thinking, well, this, this could be interesting and funny and quirky and whatever, out of the mainstream. And by the time we got to shooting it, the, the script had changed from a sort of solid blue color to one of those Crayola crayon boxes, where there are so many rewrites mm -hmm and so many variations and changes that it bore almost no resemblance to the thing that we'd all agreed to do. And it, I, you know, I was, it was unfortunate experience making it. So I thought that I was going to be fighting Bruce Willis through the top of a limousine, driving through the Kremlin with a Lenin statue falling and decapitating me, which I thought was a great, great way for my character to end. How it ended up was something completely different, and having just described that, it now in retrospect sounds like a load of tosh. <laughs> but um, at the time, it seemed like a much better idea than being melted in molten gold in a Roman gold-making factory that we shot in a terrible studio two hours outside of Hungary when it was freezing cold and no people sp nobody spoke English. The Iron Curtain had just lifted, and the idea of a fresh vegetable was um, sauerkraut that had been bottled in, the, in you know, 1914. <laughs> So um, it was not a happy experience. <laughs> but I can tell that you're on drugs and you have watched it. <laughs> <laughs> True or false? <laughs> True. <It's> what? <laughs> Whatever you're on, I want some. <laughs> but thank you for your question. I haven't worked with Bruce Willis or Joel Silver since. <laughs> Go figure. Right, put your hands up, please. Yes, in the white top there, please. So, what's your favourite line of the movie then? What's yours? Um, or what's your finest lines of energy from the monkey? My favourite film from Withnail is Uncle Monty saying, when he comes in to see Paul McGann and I standing at the <laughs> The, the, um, he comes in with two little glasses of sherry or something and says, he's so mauve, we don't know what he's up to. <laughs> I just thought that it's just such a, such a brilliant use of the word mauve. <laughs> and every time I hear mauve or see mauve anywhere, I just think that's such a, it's such an odd thing for somebody to say. He's so mauve. But it's not one that's ever quoted to me. Um, <laughs> but I know about the finest wines available to humanity one. Yeah. I don't remember lines from other things. So, but because that has had this ongoing video and then DVD and sort of live streaming cult following, um, I'm aware of the lines from that because on a daily basis, <laughs> somebody will walk up to me and go, scrubbers, <laughs> or as a youth, I used to weep in butcher's shop or perfume ponds or whatever. So I sort of got used to hearing bits and pieces of these things that are coming, coming at me. But thank you for that. <laughs> there was someone else nearby. Yes. Um, uh, if you were to play in the Bond film, what would your Bond costume be? Old Spice. <laughs> I've got my bus pass, I know. <laughs> and I cannot believe it. You know, even if I, I, when I say to you that I'm 60, I expect in my head all of you to go, oh, no, you're not, like a panto. But of course, the reality is, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> oh, no, you're not from the one woman who's 66. <laughs> Yeah. How did you keep your mark on the character in such a short time? 
Well, I got the script of Logan, and well, I got three pages of it, which has your name um, watermarked on it, even on um, an email. Uh, and there was no title, there was no name of the character, and he was speaking to this, the, the character that I, that I got for the screen test was sort of sci-fi gobbledygook stuff. So I thought, well, I, I don't know how to say this. So I just literally read it as blandly as possible. And then six months later, I was driving in the south of France from an antique fair, and as you do, <laughs> and my agent called me up, and I said, I can't really speak now. And so my wife held the phone like this to my ear, tells you a lot that I am. Um, because I did try and say speakerphone. She said, what, speakerphone, what, 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 speakerphone? She's sitting over there, so I better be careful. Um, <laughs> she held it up to the ear like this, and this agent said to me, oh, you've been cast as the, one of the villains in Logan. And I said, from what? Oh, that screen test that you did, that you self-taped and sent in. I said, no, I haven't, I haven't ever done this. And I said, can you send what I sent in <laughs> back to me so that I can see what you're talking about? <laughs> so when I got home and I saw this thing, of me just sitting there like yes, going, blah, 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 blah. I thought, they've cast me from that. I look like a zombie. <laughs> then James Mangold, the director, sent me the full script, and it was described as having a shock of red hair, and I thought, well, my hair's falling out. I can't, I have to have a wig. So I phoned the production company, and I said, my wig and the costume, all this, and they said, no, no, we're not doing any of that. And I thought, oh, fuck, I'm going to be fired. Um, sorry about the swearing. Uh, and when I got to Louisiana, they said, no, 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 this is being done like a futuristic but contemporary Western, where all that stuff of Marvel, you know, all the, the CGI and the makeup and all that stuff has been completely dispensed with. He wants this thing to be visceral and really real so that when somebody gets punched or hit or stabbed, they suffer for it as the character of Logan is Wolverine is going to die at the end of this story. So he was very adamant that's how he wanted it. So having thought that I was going to be you know, a Spider-Man costume equivalent, um, I was denied all that and put in a safari suit and told to keep my face you know, even more <laughs> tombstone feature than it already is. <laughs> so that's, that's the direction I kept getting. Do less. Do less. And I said, I don't do anything at all. He said, that's still too much. He said, dilate the eyes. So I said, like this. He said, that's what I want. So I thought, well, OK. So that's what I did. So I love it when I get emails from people saying, oh, yeah, you were so evil because you were so normal. I'm going, what the fuck? <laughs> But it took half a billion dollars, so obviously I've made the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for your question. All right, anyone over this side? No? All right, Jan from just there. Um, what makes the yeah. sound strange when you're listening to you with the hotel series? Thank you. I'm, I'm guessing you didn't need too much direction on that. There was no direction on the hotel yeah. series whatsoever. We had a tiny crew of, has anybody seen what, what this gentleman's asked me about? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're all Sky Atlantic subscribers. <laughs> Unlike my posh neighbors who go, oh, no. <laughs> we don't subscribe to Sky. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to do Morningside, and I've gone completely up the swanee. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> uh, no, no, no. What, what happened with that is that we started filming in New York at the end of that first week, interviewed Donald Trump, God help me. Um, <laughs> he's now the president of the United States. <laughs> Can you believe it? I still can't. Um, and... On the first day, I got, I got the notes uh, of who I was interviewing and the hotels that I was going into. And so the first hotel I went into, I jumped on the beds and licked the plates and did all the things that I would do normally in my own life. <laughs> and then on the second day, they sent those rushes immediately you know, online to London. And on the third day, when the feedback came back, it was on the second day, I didn't do that thinking, well, He's never going to use any of that. Um, the response came back from the production company saying that they'd previewed it with a small group of people. And they said, you haven't jumped on any beds or licked any plates. That's the signature of this series. You've got to keep on doing that. So I thought, fucking great. <laughs> this is wonderful for me. So I'm going to get to eat more. So I jumped on all those beds. Um, so I was surprised by that. And then I got abuse from people saying, you should have taken off your shoes. It was disrespectful. <laughs> so when did the second series in the, in in Japan and China and, and you know, that side of the world, 
there was a proviso in the contract, well, a clause in the contract saying you cannot jump on beds in Japan, you cannot lick plates in China because it's, it's disrespectful. So they'd have monitors, you know, people in the hotels coming around saying he cannot jump on the bed. So of course they'd get somebody to decoy them and just go and jump on the bed and lick the plates. <laughs> so you know, I haven't been back to those hotels <laughs> since. But that's how that came about. So it was completely unscripted and it meant that I was able to ask all the questions that I wanted to ask, because I told you right at the beginning of this, I'm a nosy parker. So it was a real free-for-all and an incredible job to be paid to go and do that, which I absolutely love. And people th st still assume that I'm doing it on a monthly basis because <laughs> they did, we did two series and they endlessly repeat them on Sky. And somebody said, oh, I saw you in Hong Kong last week. And I know it was four years ago. <laughs> thank you for your question. Okay, was there someone over here? Oh, hand up? No? Okay. Did you all hear that? No. What was my mother's reaction to seeing herself portrayed by Miranda Richardson, I'm elaborating, in Wawa, which is my autobiographical film? Um, I was very, she had seen the script, and I said, this is what I want to make, and we'd had, post my psychoanalysis of two years, we'd had a rapprochement after being estranged for 36 years. So she read the script, and of course, because a script is written in almost telegraphy's form, and that you know, a whole event that may have taken a month you know, happens in one page, mm -hmm. um, and is concertinaed in time. So I did warn her about that, but she read it, and she said, this, you know, I give you my <coughs> consent to go ahead and make this. Not that I wouldn't have done it if she hadn't given me my consent. Um, you know, fuck it. Uh, and when she saw it, I was very nervous about her reaction, because she saw it with a you know, full house of people. Uh, she said, that is exactly how it was, and it was deadly accurate. Um, and then I spoke to her close friends, and they said, oh, she, you have to understand that she was played by Miranda. She looked fantastic in it. Uh, she went off with this other guy who was good looking. And she had your father drinking himself to death for unrequited love for her. And the kid, me, Nicholas Holt playing me, um, you know, longing for her to come back. So it's a win-win from her point of view. <laughs> so I understood what narcissism really is. That you, you see it completely from, you know, the reflected glory of, of how she saw it. So she didn't see it in the critical way, whereas if my daughter wrote me in the movie the way I, I portrayed her, I would probably have facial surgery and go and live in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't see it like that. And also, what was, you know, I'm being disingenuous, but what was ameliorating is that I had s written it from the point of view of a... 10 and then 14 year old boy and that was my perspective on it so and I think you know she was gracious enough to accept that that is where it came from um, and she has watched it repeatedly mm -hmm. and her friends who didn't know her at that time of her life have been in great admiration of what a racy past she had <laughs> so it's a win-win for all of us <laughs> but thank you for your question there's someone else down here I think yes sir yes sir your beard is fantastic. Thank you. I'm so jealous because I've attempted one and it's basically rat's pubes, what I end up with. <laughs> and you have the full bush. I have to tell you, it's upsetting my wife by this call because she's not a massive fan. But, uh, <laughs> she's not a massive fan. He's never getting rid of it now. <laughs> oh, I thought he was offended when I said rat's pubes. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Okay. And I can't grow a beard. <laughs> Barbara Streisand singing to me right here, right now. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, gosh, that's, I'd have to really think about that. I'd, top of your bucket list, what do you think? Top of my bucket list of who I'd like to work with. 
Well, I've just done a movie with Melissa McCarthy, and I tell you, I don't know whether you know who she is. She was in Bridesmaids. She is one of the all-time great human beings you could ever wish to meet, never mind you know, have the privilege of working with. So I absolutely loved her. Um, but, you know, there are, there are a string of directors I still like to work, to work with and for. So, and Go there's on, a give us, give there's us one a or new, two. Go on. New, well, I'd like to play a sort of old, laggy, <laughs> lounge singer in a hotel, motel in Vegas for Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> um, I just think that I would be perfect for that part. Um, but I haven't told him this and I haven't met him. So maybe if anybody in the room knows Pass him, on, can yeah. you just say, Quentin, there's this guy in England that you know, would fancy a twirl playing a Vegas singer in a motel somewhere. And he could develop the plot. So that's my bucket list, but thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, right at the back. What was it like working with Little, th on The Little Vampire? Yeah, with Kieran Carter, that also appears in there, that play is the Esau Vampire character. R right. Um, well, he was the butler in Downton Abbey, so he was serving me, which I don't <laughs> think he liked very much. Um, and on The Little Vampire, where we were united because the director tried to get Jonathan Lipnicki, who had been in to um, Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire who was playing little boy, the little vampire, um, in order to keep him working longer hours, he was being given speed pills in sweets. What? Exactly my reaction. And Jim is a father, and I'm a father, and we were outraged by this. The director's name is Uli Udell, and if he wants to sue me for this, he can come. Because you know, I'd read all about the child stars of Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, all those people who were you know, on these uppers and downers. And doing this, working those extended hours, and trying to, to keep him doing that was so outrageous to me that that is what galvanized Jim Carter and I together. Um, and we put a stop to it. So we were crusaders for justice on that. Wow. But thank you for your question. <laughs> One or two more questions, please put your hands up. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now this is this is a case of where you choose one project over another. If you are, you know, I was fortunate at one point in my career to be offered two things sort of practically on the same day. And one of them was called Pret a Porte, that Robert Altman directed. And the other one was called Priscilla Queen of the Desert. <laughs> Priscilla Queen of the Desert was a first time director. <coughs> I was told I was gonna have to shove my gonads backwards in a harness for six weeks, shave my legs, wear false boobs, and be in a bus in 40 degree heat in the Australian desert. Or be in Paris with Robert Altman, Julia Roberts, Sophia Loren, Anouk M.A., Lyle Lovett, um, up, down, and sideways, an extraordinary cast of people. And I thought, well, uh, I'm gonna go to Paris instead. And that turned out to be the wrong <laughs> career decision because the film was such a flop. But it was a great experience to make, and I made great friends with it, and it was my, th my second time working for Robert Altman, so that was a bonus. But career-wise, I should have gone into the uh, squashed gonad bus. <laughs> <laughs> so that is one that got away, because that is another cult. I could have, had, I could have been talking to Priscilla and Withnail fans at once. <laughs> Thank you for bringing up that Thank painful you. question. <laughs> I'm crossing my legs at the thought. <laughs> I do have showgirl legs too. I would have looked <laughs> fucking fabulous in those tights. There's a hand up there. <laughs> Go ahead. Are you the um, what we're going to watch in the hotel <laughs> and which hotel questionnaire? You just shown it to your 17-year-old daughter, and she thought you were mentally retarded. <laughs> she didn't get it. <laughs> Throw it open to the house. What age do you need to be to get that film, if ever? <laughs> You've got a defective kid, says stage right. 
fight out amongst yourselves. I don't know how to answer that. Has she ever tried the marijuana? <laughs> because I found when I had a joint with my daughter the first time, she suddenly got that film completely. There you go. Parenting advice. <laughs> Was there someone trying to? Yes, go ahead. This will be the last one. Sorry if I've missed. When was the last time I saw Paul McGann? When was the last time I saw Paul McGann? What, the actual date? <laughs> um, I went to see him and he did a play that, that has, has been on tour, and I went to see him in the play just before I went to Chicago. So that's when I saw him. He's in fine health. <laughs> And apparently he was invited to the festival, and I don't think they heard back. <laughs> so, so, regrettably, he's he here? not here he's to here share this. <laughs> but thank you for your final question. And I hope that your daughter gets help before she's um, attacked by that man on the far right. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> thank you.